All right, welcome to our discussion on AI and large language models. So I'm sorry I can't be in person. Uh, I promise next Tuesday we will actually uh, have some pretty interesting stuff as we discuss ChatGPT, but this is the precursor to actually using ChatGPT and you know showing you all the functionality uh, that maybe you don't know about. Uh, so in this video, uh, what I'll do is I'll start off giving you a breakdown of what big data is and the field of data science. Then we'll dive into some of the big data techniques that maybe you've heard of, maybe you haven't. I'll talk about neural networks and I'll define AI. We'll talk about how natural language processing works. And then at the very end of this video, I'll talk about how large language models like ChatGPT actually work. Now, I asked you for today's video lecture to actually read a particular paper, or at least glance through it. And that paper was this thing right here, attention is all you need. Now the reason I wanted you guys to at least look through this paper, certainly read the abstract, uh, but you know, just go through this and try to get a sense of what's going on, is because this is the paper that's credited with introducing what are called transformer models. Now transformer models, I'll talk about them uh, in a few minutes or probably at the near the end of this little video lecture. Uh, these are, I mean, essentially chat GPT and a lot of the other large language models that we talk about, we use, uh, they're all transformer models. So this is kind of the, the precursor to a lot of the models that you hear about, you use, uh, you're going to be hearing a lot more about in the future. So, you know, this is a very, very important paper. All right, so uh, before we get to that though, I did want to give you the background on this entire area, data science. And when I talk about data science, you know, you, we have an entire major for data science, but it's really just the field that harnesses computer science, technology, stats, uh, in order to extract information from big data sets. And when I say big data sets, I really mean massive, massive data sets that are just uh, significantly larger than what we might often use in finance. So data scientists, what they'll do is they'll typically what we call mine raw data and they'll search for patterns. Uh, so this term, when we say data mining, this for a long time in finance has had a really negative connotation. Uh, we've used it in the past to find anomalies or variables that predict future stock returns. Uh, a lot of that data mining is very similar to what a data scientist might do. You know, we search and search only t until we find this variable or set of variables in combination that predict future outcomes. Uh, so data science, it basically everything I'm going to talk about today is data science. Uh, and if you find that stuff interesting, well, I'll, you know, there's all kinds of ways that you can explore that. Now, I do have some definitions with respect to data science, you'll hear me maybe mention them a couple of times, but when we talk about data science methods, there's all kinds of data science methods out there. When we say data capture, this is essentially how we go out and get the data because data science or big data methods, you know, initially we have to get that data. How do we do it? Well, we could scrape the internet, we could acquire some massive data set, that's data capture. Next, we need to curate that data because a lot of this data is really, really messy. If I were to ask you to go out and collect all the data that Facebook, or I guess technically Meta has, there's going to be a lot of messiness in that data. Maybe people use uh, a lot of oh special characters or emojis that don't translate nicely uh, in our when we actually perform analysis. So data curation is this process where we we ensure that all of the data has some minimum quality. We make sure that there's, you know, it's this data is re relatively accurate. Maybe we make everything lowercase so it's easier to analyze. Data storage, pretty straightforward. How do we, you know, save that data? How do we access that data, et cetera, et cetera. And then once we've got that data, once we've stored that data, we want to be able to search that data you know, that's the idea behind search, you know, how do we query data? You know, SQL is a popular language for querying big data sets. And then finally, how do we get that data from our data source, from this big data set or set of data sets into some kind of tool like an app, like ChatGPT? Now, the data science process, uh, I thought I'd just show you this because, you know, it, it is worth seeing the entire process. Uh, essentially, first part, 
we want to try and understand. You know, we want to ask relatively important questions and then acquire data. Uh, so we mine data. That's the next step. Once we've asked a question or identified a question we want, we want to answer, get our data, clean that data. Usually we're going to explore the data. This is uh, data exploration where we kind of determine what might actually matter in that big data set, in that uh, set of messy data that is now somewhat clean. Next, based on the exploration, we come up with what are called features. And in the statistics world, we might call these variables. These are just characteristics that might help us predict certain outcomes. You know, in finance, it might be like ROA or total assets or something like that. Uh, but in data science, we just call these features. Then we use some kind of predictive model. And believe me when I tell you, there are a lot of these. I'll try to keep it pretty general in this video, but trust me, there's hundreds of these different types of models. Uh, it is a messy, messy thing. So once we use our predictive model, our goal is to, you know, predict maybe some outcome, you know, the next word, if it's a large language model, or uh, the number of bankruptcies, if we're trying to predict, uh, you know, corporate default using textual data, something like that. And then very often we want to visualize this data. We want to make it very easy to understand. And doing that visually really, really helps. All right, so this big data, Typically, what we have are a couple of different characteristics that we care about. Volume is the amount of data. You know, how big is this data set in terms of number of observations or uh, total actual size of the data set? Uh, you can see just many, many terabytes or even uh, petabytes worth of data. Next, we have velocity. How quickly is this data coming in? I mean, are we talking about real-time data or close to real-time data? In other words, are we dealing with something like Twitter, where there's always new data coming in? Or are we dealing with something that's a little slower uh, in terms of new, new data being generated? And then also, we want to know the variety of data that's being generated. Is it just coming from Twitter? Or is it just coming from Facebook? Or is it coming from, like, the entire internet? That's going to determine what techniques we use. Once we can assess this, this is really where we you know, we, you know, once we can put these on a plot like this, this is where we can kind of determine uh, what techniques we use. So, for example, if we've got, oh, let's say, uh, oh, large, very large data that is, uh, you know, very, very messy, you know, that might be social media data. Uh, and if we have something that's pretty small, say a couple gigabytes, that might be a single database. And depending on the the type of data, the volume of data, the velocity of data, you know, like I said, that's going to absolutely determine which techniques we use. Now, uh, finally, getting away from the, the basic data science stuff, uh, you've heard a bunch of these terms probably in passing, artificial intelligence, machine learning, neural networks, deep learning. These are all terms that we, white, we frequently use in data science. And uh, the best way I've ever heard it described is by saying these are essentially like a Russian nesting doll. Artificial intelligence is kind of the broadest term here, and I'll define it appropriately in a second. But under the umbrella of artificial intelligence, you have machine learning. And there's a bunch of techniques in machine learning. So, you know, transformers uh, or, you know, all kinds of other stuff would technically be machine learning. Uh, there are sub, there's a subset of machine learning called neural networks, which I'll show you a couple of these things in uh, a couple of, well, at least one simulation. And then neural networks, they get very complicated. Uh, and then, you know, you can have some neural networks that are considered deep learning, where we have a bunch of different uh, layers to those models. So, uh, you know, when we say deep learning, it's just a type of neural network, which is a type of machine learning, which is a type of artificial intelligence. Now, let me define artificial intelligence. So artificial intelligence is this area of computer science that focuses on essentially replicating human intelligence. Very, very basic. Like I said, it's kind of this umbrella. You know, under this umbrella, we have machine learning, we have deep learning. Outside of those things I just mentioned on the last slide, we also have things like computer vision, using AI techniques to interpret visual info. And then we also have NLP, natural language processing, uh, which is 
you know, essentially these large language models where we use huge amounts of text data and then use that data to predict the next word or the next phrase in the sentence or, you know, whatever we're trying to generate. All right, so uh, let me start off, before I get to the detailed large language stuff, I think it's important that I kind of go through what's going on with a lot of these AI models. And to get us started, I'll, I'll start with deep learning. Uh, so deep learning, like I said, it's a type of neural network or machine learning uh, where you imitate the way that humans gain intelligence. Uh, there are a huge number of deep learning techniques. Uh, this is kind of a summary video, but if you want to hear a little more about this, I have uh, you know, linked this YouTube video from Two Sigma where they talk about some of the techniques that they use. Uh, once we get a little broader though, this is where it gets interesting because we move into neural networks. And neural networks, uh, these are essentially, I mean, think of a, I mean, think of neurons in the brain. I mean, it's, there is a lot of complexity here. It's a type of machine learning. And the best thing that I can say about these is that we very often consider them black boxes. We don't know exactly how a lot of these operate, uh, but basically, we, uh, we build a model that has at least one layer or many different hidden layers, and we ask the model to achieve some task or accomplish some goal, and then the network itself essentially figures out the best way to accomplish that goal. Uh, so if our goal is to maximize the accuracy of a validation data set, uh, what this model is going to do is it's going to run, it's going to take a series of input data try to predict output data, and then, you know, we won't know exactly how it's doing that because these things, like I said, are black boxes, uh, but, you know, it is gonna get us something that should be relatively accurate. That's about as vague as I can possibly make these before we go into any great detail. Uh, but if you want a graphical interpretation of what these neural networks are, uh, let's, uh, here's a graphic. So these neural networks, uh, this is as simple as I can make it, Basically, you have an input layer. These are our features. Remember, in data science, features are akin to variables in statistics. So each of these features in, in finance, it might be like ROA or total assets or something like that. It's basically a different variable that we can measure as an input. Now, we'll have some outputs that we want. Maybe we want to know which firm will have the highest return in the next year. Maybe we want to know which will have the highest ROA in the next year, uh, something like that. So what we do is we have at least one hidden layer, and these are where the neurons come in. Basically, we ask the computer model to uh, optimize or you know, essentially find the relationships that would give us the best output possible. Uh, essentially, you know, we might say that feature one, uh, you know, we, we take two times feature one and that will predict output one. Uh, if we have feature two, we might take feature two squared uh, and then, you know, that'll be a function of predicting output layer, output one. Now, uh, that's, I mean, it's, it's very simplistic. I think maybe I'm not doing as good of a job as I could, but let's go through this in steps. So step one, when you're using a neural network, you, you break your data set into two sets. I've already mentioned the validation data set. That's the second data set. The training data set is where you try to perfect this neural network, this, this AI model. So for example, we might break up this thing into, you know, 75% of the observations go into the training data set, and then 25 go into the validation data set, basically the output or the, uh, the, the holdout sample. Next, we build our model in the training data set. So we adjust the weights of all of our input variables so that we minimize the total bias in the training data set. So for example, if Z is our output feature, and each of these X variables are input features, we adjust the weights that we assign to each of these input features such that we're minimizing this B bias. And then, you know, ultimately, uh, you know, we take that model and once we have the, the weights that we want, we use that model to predict 
our outcomes in the validation data set. So this is the, the old way that neural networks used to be done when I first started uh, you know, doing research. You know, it's nowadays, there's a lot more complexity here. Uh, but generally, we're going to repeat this many times with the goal of maximizing our validation data set accuracy. There's, like I said, lots of ways to do this. This is literally as simple as I can make it. Now, if you want to know exactly what, you know, what techniques exist out there, uh, I put together a short list. I mean, under every single one of these uh, types of neural networks, there's a few additional types. So, for example, you know, our basic basic neural networks, we, we might have something like Perceptron, uh, you know, support vector machine. Uh, there's, I mean, we're talking about dozens and dozens of these different types of neural networks. Now, if I go down here, some of the, the more advanced ones are going to be uh, like uh, self-supervised learning, transformers. Like I said at the beginning of this video, uh, ChatGPT and a lot of these large language models, these are transformer models, and I'll talk about them in detail in a bit. But I, I just wanted to show you the complexity of some of, you know, of the neural networks. You know, I've just shown you the most basic type of neural network so far. Uh, now, you know, going back to our example here, you've got, you know, this output and you've got these feature inputs. And like I said, you're trying to uh, reduce the bias here. So to make this example a little more complex, let's say, you know, each of these values, x1 and x2, is, you know, oh, let's say it's orange and blue. And you want to separate the orange and blue balls on a 2D space so that you've got the lowest, or we'll say the, the most accuracy. Uh, so what you're going to do is you're going to separate your data into a training data set and a validation data set. And then you're going to run a neural network. You know, you could run any neural network you wanted. Uh, you know, it needs to be appropriate. But your goal here is to say, you know, identify the best way to separate your orange and blue uh, data. So the best example I can give you would be something like this data visualizer right here. So here we have I think the best way to visualize, truly visualize how a neural network works. Uh, I found this a couple of years ago and I've never stopped using it. Uh, so like I said, you have your features over here. You have your output over here. And the goal in this example is to separate the orange and the blue dots uh, by essentially identifying the space where there's primarily blue dots and there's primarily orange dots. So the orange background should you know, encompass all of the orange dots if this thing was perfectly accurate and the blue uh, space that you can kind of see here should encompass all these blue dots if this model is completely accurate. Uh, now with machine learning, you know, you're not just doing this once. Uh, you know, you can, you can increase the number of hidden layers. So right now I've got this as one. This is a very simple neural network, but, and we've got six neurons. And each of these neurons, like I said, is you know, you can make these a little different. Maybe it's, you know, you double things or you uh, take it to the second power or something like that. Uh, if we wanted to, we could add a bunch of hidden layers. You know, let's make this more complicated. And, you know, let's say this is our data set. We've got a lot of orange balls or orange dots, and we've got some blue dots here in the middle. And we want to identify uh, the orange space or identify where the orange balls are versus the blue balls. So, you know, we'll say this is a, a learning rate. We'll start with 0.1. And uh, ratio of training data to test data, 50%. Let's go ahead and uh, let's go ahead and, oh, like I said, I, uh, you know, I mentioned that there's this training data set or, uh, you know, initial data set, and then there's the validation data set. Your test data is, you know, it's still there. It's just not populating, uh, but let's go ahead and hit the play button. You'll see how this works. Uh, so already notice here that we've run our data, our inputs through these three hidden layers, each with at least four neurons. And the model is trying to identify where the blue space is or where the blue dots are and where the orange space is. So right here is our accuracy for the model. So Right now, we're pretty darn accurate with our training data, you know, less than 10% misclassified. In the test model, the validation data set, we're a little less accurate. So, 
you know, we're in a, we're, we're inaccurate on about 35, 36% of our outcomes. And you can see those data right here if I plot them right here. So now that's, that's a very, I mean, the best way that I could recommend uh, that we visualize this thing. Now, these neural networks, like I said, they get very, very complicated. Uh, you know, you can have all kinds of things. I, I will not ask you, you know, a question on perceptron or feed forward networks on the exam. I, I feel like, you know, asking you on specific neural networks is a bit much, but you know, there, there is a huge number of these things. So perceptron, basically this is a binary class of classifier. So for example, what it might do, uh, is help us identify, is this picture, say you've got two pictures, is this a picture of a cat or is this a picture of a dog? You know, we'll say cat is one, dog is zero. Is this a one or a zero? So you send this picture through a series of hidden layers and you determine, you know, this particular photo, is it a cat? Well, yes, that's perceptron. Basically, you're trying to, in your test data or validation data set, determine is this, you know, a one or a zero, cat versus dog? You know, ultimately, you know, you're, you're trying to separate the observations based on a couple of characteristics, and then this might be cat up here, this might be dog right here. But if you want to actually read this uh, explanation of Perceptron, please feel free. It's, it's linked in our uh, PowerPoint. Uh, Feed-forward networks, I mean, this is really, I mean, a straightforward type of neural network. Basically, these are neural networks where you just have data flowing forward through each hidden layer. Uh, there's a lot of other neural networks out there, uh, but like I said, you can have many, many hidden layers here. You can have, you know, certain outputs. You can have, I mean, you'll see at the very end of this video how many inputs ChatGPT has. Uh, you know, the, the number of features can be in the hundreds. It's more likely it's going to be, for a large language model, in the millions, billions, or even trillions of uh, of uh, features. So, you know, you can have a lot of data here, and this is why these models really haven't existed for a long time, because there's just a huge amount of data being analyzed. Now, like I said, neural networks are a specific type of machine learning, and machine learning, uh, this is just a set of techniques where we, we use an algorithm to specify inputs and outputs. And Machine learning algorithms, you know, I've already listed how many of these things. Uh, they have some benefits here. Uh, you know, neural networks have been fantastic at doing things like predicting firm bankruptcy in the past. Uh, they can do all kinds of other things. Uh, but one big issue with these machine learning algorithms like neural networks is that they can be overfitted, meaning that you've got too many features and the model is, you know, they the model sees some artifact of the training data set and believes that that will predict in the validation or test dating, uh, test data set. So this is a well-known problem with a lot of these neural networks and machine learning techniques is that you've got so much data that you're training on. Sometimes these artifacts of the training data set uh, inform the, you know, the computer or the model uh, to, you know, make certain decisions that are not appropriate. Now, machine learning techniques beyond just neural networks uh, can get even more complex. I mean, we when we talk about machine learning, we can break it down into uh, what's called supervised learning and unsupervised learning. And supervised learning, uh, this is really where the, the neural networks are. We can also have things like linear regression, if you remember your, your stats, or obviously if you've had me for like 310 or 410, uh, you've certainly seen how linear regression works. Basically, we're just trying to identify coefficients, so betas that minimize the sum of squared errors here. So this, you know, these supervised learning techniques, they're pretty straightforward. Basically, you're using some kind of machine learning technique to uh, identify relationships, and you need some goal, like predicting stock returns, or predicting ROA, or predicting something like that. Uh, so linear regression is technically a machine learning technique, same as neural networks. The more interesting stuff is down here when, where we talk about unsupervised learning. Uh, 
And unsupervised learning techniques are machine learning techniques where you, you really just give the computer some data. You, you know, you have the computer, you know, build an algorithm itself, and then uh, typically you'll ask it to find some relationships in the data that may be of interest. So, uh, you know, if you want to see a couple of examples here, uh, you know, there's all kinds of these uh, unsupervised learning techniques. One of the most common ones or well-known ones is what's called clustering. And clustering, basically you're asking the, uh, the machine learning algorithm to identify data or data observations that are relatively similar. So cluster the data together, you know, based on certain characteristics. So we might find that maybe there are certain observations where there's a similarity or a set of similarities and you know we may be able to use those simu you know, similarities in some way. So uh, you know there's there's a lot here. So for example, if I go down a little here, I think this is probably a good example. Uh, if we have this data set and we've got you know A B C D E F, and they're plotted right here, can we ask the computer to you know take this data and do something with it? Well, it might do something like this, where it sees that A, B, C, and D are clustered over here, and E and F are over here. So it separates A, B, C, and D from E and F, and then it keeps going further. So C and D, you might say, are not as close to A and B, so it, it brings A and B together under the same cluster, and then C is in its own cluster, and then D is in its own cluster. So you have you know, basically this unsupervised model takes some data and then identifies clusters of observations, you know, observation groups that are very, very similar. And, you know, the best way to show this is on a 2D space. All right, so that's about all I would really want to say about uh, neural networks. Now, another type of artificial intelligence is natural language processing. And natural language processing is the type of AI technique that we see in ChatGPT and a lot of these large language models. So I think it's important for me to walk through how that actually works. Now, step one in this process for these natural language processing models, these NLP models, is you get some data. You know, this might be some single data set or you might have scraped everything you could off of the internet, which is what a lot of these large language models are doing now. So you take some data, huge amount of text, and you clean it. So, you know, there's basically, this is what we call the pre-processing period, where you take this data, you clean it, uh, you split it into what are called tokens. So these could be words or even parts of words. They could be sentences or phrases that are common in the data set itself. Uh, you also are going to do something like, you know, techniques like normalization, where you remove all the punctuation, you bring all the letters down so they're, they're lowercase, maybe you remove, you know, things like emojis or uh, apostrophe symbols or anything like that. Uh, and then you can also do things like stemming, where you reduce every word to its root form. So having in the data set might become have, so that you can use it at you know, in your model more accurately. So text pre-processing is the first step in natural language processing. Essentially, clean the data. Next, uh, what you're going to do, or this model is going to do, is it's going to convert all the text into a numerical representation. Representation. So, uh, you know, words might become numbers. Uh, you know, basically the key here is to get a numerical representation that you can run through a machine learning algorithm. So there's a lot of techniques out there that'll do this, like the bag of words approach, uh, word embeddings. Uh, bag of words is the one I'm, I'm certainly the most familiar with. Uh, it's been a long time, but I, I seem to recall that is, uh, that's a pretty popular technique. Uh, next, once you've extracted features or you know you've identified these words or uh, tokens as it were and I created features then you can model the data so there's a lot of models out there you can uh, perform things like uh, recurrent neural networks if you want to see a little more about these feel free to click this link uh, there's also some newer models out there called transformer models uh, so one of the most popular ones out there is BERT 
Uh, and then obviously chat GPT or GPT. Uh, now GPT, this is the transformer model that chat GPT uses. Uh, so uh, you are finally here where we can start to talk about transformer models, which is what I asked you to read about before this lecture video. Uh, so you're going to model the data and uh, basically your, your goal here is to kind of uh, run this through a series of uh, hidden layers. You know, think back to our discussion of uh, neural networks. You're going to have a series of hidden layers here and you're going to ask the machine learning algorithm to essentially connect our features, our feature variables to our output variables. So we're, we're separating our data set into a training data set and a test data set, and we run our training data set on, uh, through some model, uh, and then we, we try and predict outcomes in the, the validation data set. Now, uh, there are some other things I should mention. You know, there's all kinds of things we can do with natural language processing. We can use it to analyze sentiment. Uh, we can, uh, some of these models will identify parts of speech uh, that'll help when you're say predicting what the next word is in a transformer model uh, and then ultimately once you've run this data through your your model uh, that's where the fun stuff comes in because you know you can use these models to generate natural language so you can ask the model take this input data that i just gave you and summarize it so what that you know, that model might do is it takes that input data, uses the model it's already built using its training data set, and then predicts what the first word should be in your summarization, and then, you know, the next word, the next word, the next word, on and on and on. Uh, so you can do, you know, you can, these natural language mo processing models, you can use them to generate text, you can tr use them to translate data, you can do use them to summarize do data. And then ultimately, uh, you know, these models, they're not perfect. You know, obviously, if you've messed around with some of these natural language processing models, you'll see, you'll have noticed that they get some errors in there. You know, essentially, at all times, the data scientists that are building these models, they're fine-tuning them because we're, we're always going to have new data, new text coming in that can be added to the model. Now, there's all kinds of ways to measure accuracy of these models uh, in the CFA curriculum uh, they ask you to be familiar with things like recall and precision. Uh, there's a lot of other metrics out there for natural language processing and, uh, you know, prediction, you know, things like F1 score. Uh, but basically, these models at all times, they're being fine-tuned to try and make them more accurate and incorporate new data because new data is absolutely coming into the model. Uh, or, you know, it, it can be used in the model. Maybe they're using an, uh, a fixed data set. And then finally, you know, if a model is seen as good, you know, you've tested it, you, the training data set uh, gives you good results and you're finding good results in the validation data set or the output data set, that's when you consider deploying it. So for example, you know, with ChatGPT, this model was probably built months and months and if not years before it was actually deployed. The key here is finding out what works best. Maybe there's some changes you can make. Maybe there's some uh, data sets in the, you know, you know, some initial data sets you, you don't want to include, maybe you want a different kind of model, uh, but ultimately when this thing is deployed, that's when it becomes something we would recognize, like chat GPT or a voice assistant or something like that. All right, so, uh, yeah, I mean, that's, that's pretty much that. Now, large language models, they're, they're kind of like a natural language processing. I mean, you take this training data set, uh, so we might take things like books or magazine articles or, you know, web pages. We use those to learn some patterns, run it through our machine learning algorithm. Uh, maybe it's got many, many different layers or hidden layers. And then we, we essentially uh, I use that to predict whatever we want. Uh, there's a lot of different large language models out there. Uh, so I mentioned transformer architecture. Uh, I'll give you some more information on that in a second. But basically, these large language models, you know, they're, they're really nothing more than natural language processing models. We can use, you know, these models that have huge numbers of hidden layers. Uh, every model might have a different number of layers or a different number of nodes in each layer. You know, this, it, it gets complicated. 
Now, finally, 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 you know, these there are a certain type of models out there called transformer models. And this is the type of model that uh, the, the actual paper that I gave you to read uh, before this video is. I mean, these transformer models, they were described in a 2017 paper, uh, and they're kind of a new way, a new type of neural network. Basically, you have mod this model that's built on uh, what are called encoders and decoders. And encoders are used to process the input text, and they focus on understanding context. So uh, essentially, uh, you know, you're taking a large amount of input data, and then the decoder generates the text output. So it's kind of a, a two-step process, I guess, even though you have many, many different hidden layers here. Uh, now, one key component of these transformer models is that you have this attention mechanism. And this attention mechanism, it allows your transformers to uh, focus on specific words and their relationship with every other word in the data set. So there's this term out there in uh, in when we talk about transformer models called self-attention. And if you want to see a little more about that, click this link. But basically self-attention is it, it involves us identifying the relationship between each word in the transformer model with every other word. And then you, you basically do that for every single word, and then you can create these attention scores. So we might see that, like, in a certain sentence, uh, one word has really high attention scores, and that could affect what the next word in that, uh, in that sentence might be. Now, word position, obviously, you know, it, it certainly matters when, we're, when these models are being built. And uh, these models, they, they use a feed-forward network. In other words, we have an input layer of features. We'll have a set of nodes in the first hidden layer. And then the output from that set of nodes is fed forward into the next set of nodes in the next hidden layer, and so on and so forth. Uh, now, the transformer output that you get, uh, you know, so let's say you're using ChatGPT and you ask it a question, what you'll notice is that it's it's giving you one word or a few words at a time. It's predicting what the best word to use is using a probability distribution of all possible words. So if you ask it a question, you might get something like, you know, the first word that you get is like uh, it, and then it'll take that first word that it gave and it'll use that as an input for predicting what the next word in that sentence should be. Maybe the next word that comes out as most likely should be is. It's got the highest probability of being next, and then it just keeps uh, doing that over and over for every word in the output that you you receive. So for example, uh, you know, I mentioned Darren Asamoglu in Tuesday's class when I talked about the Nobel Prize in Economics. If I ask ChatGPT, who is Darren Asamoglu? You know, basically, notice here we got individual words coming out at a single time. Maybe you've got a grouping of words. But like I said, uh, a after every word, that new word is being fed back into the model and being used to help predict what the next word should be. Now, ChatGPT, uh, you know, a special type uh, or a specific uh, transformer model, you know, it is a neural network that's designed to generate human-like text. So we use the term GPT, that stands for Generative Pre-Trained Transformers. Uh, this is a special type of transformer model, uh, and, you know, I guess that's really as deep as I would want to go into the architecture of these GPT models, but I thought it'd be useful to show you just how many features and nodes are actually in some of these models because these things are impressively complex. So, uh, like I said, transformer models were first detailed uh, or published on in 2017, that article that I gave you. In 2018, GPT or uh, OpenAI rolled out GPT-1. It had a 12-level uh, a transformer parameters. Uh, so we have, you know, 117 million features. Uh, we've got a huge amount of data, so 7,000 unpublished books of various genres, uh, so 4.5 gigabytes worth of text, and it took about 30 days on this computer to actually train this data set. 
as we go forward in time, you know, the, the number of parameters increases and the total volume of text that it's being trained on is going to increase. So it goes from 117 million features to 1.5 billion all the way out to, we don't know the exact number for chat G, for GPT-4, but it's estimated at about 1.7 trillion. Uh, we don't know exactly what the training data is for this data set, uh, but it's estimated that the training cost was about, well, 2.1, uh, well, I'm not even going to try and estimate exactly how many flops that is. That's like, uh, well, it's it's a lot of, lot of data. Uh, so, yeah, uh, so that is essentially ChatGPT in a nutshell. It's essentially a, you know, a large language model that takes a huge amount of data, uh, runs it through a machine learning algorithm, and then uses that algorithm to try and predict what the next word should be based on your input and the words that it's already given you as outputs. So uh, if I could summarize what I just talked about, I'd say that, you know, we started off talking about data science and data scientists, they mine or buy raw data, they clean it, and they use it to predict future outcomes. In the last couple of years, we've seen a lot of big data techniques be rolled out, things like large language models, neural networks, and deep learning. Some of these things are subsets of each other. So, you know, deep learning is a subset of neural networks. Large language models, you could say, you know, these are kind of distinct, uh, but all of them are technically AI or artificial intelligence techniques. Uh, these neural networks that we talked about, they're always going to contain at least one hidden layer, which is why I say that they're black boxes. We don't know exactly what's going on. And then AI, you know, the AI that you hear about in, uh, you know, in society, this is just a broad set of techniques. I mean, a lot of the techniques I mentioned in this video, uh, many of these, these techniques like Perceptron have exi existed, you know, since I was a student. So, you know, these, these things have been around for decades. Uh, so, you know, we'll see what comes next, but, you know, there's always going to be a new next model and it's probably going to be even more complex than what we've seen so far. So with that, I'm going to conclude. And if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out and I hope you have a great weekend. Bye.